Hi, everyone. I'm Blake Kabashigawa, VP of Sales here at IDW Publishing. Uh, today, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome two very special creators and longtime creative partners, uh, both of whom are working on the highly anticipated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin Limited series. Uh, first, we have writer, artist, and co-creator of the TMNT franchise, Kevin Eastman. Kevin, wave to your adoring public. There you go. And, uh, and with him, we've got a longtime TMNT writer, um, the wonderful Tom Waltz. Tom, say hello. Um, so let's let's start at the beginning here. I guess how did how did the last run take shape, and you know from from initial contact to a, to a green lit actual physical living thing. Well, the the, the short version is, um, you know, I, I just had had you know nine of the most awesome years working um, with uh, the incredible Tom Waltz and, and Bobby Turner and so many fantastic artists that spent uh, all that time bringing hundred issues to life. And, you know, Tom and I, uh, uh, well, I always tell Tom I'm his biggest fan. Um, and so as we sort of were looking um, in the beginning of 2019 towards the end of, um, the, to wrap up, you know, hundred issues, we were sort of discussing what we could do next. Um, and I had discovered, um, rediscovered a, 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 an outline that Peter and I did, we wrote together back in 1987. I mentioned this to Tom and I said, you know, Pete and I wrote a story, turtle story in 1987 that took place 30 years in the future, which was 2017. <laughs> so we were already like, you know, two years past that. Um, and so I, I said, I'm gonna, let me dust it off and I'll, I'll, I'll make a few notes on it and then um, I'll, I'll put it in front of you and see if it does anything. And so, uh, um, I think I got more excited as I sort of tweaked it, put it in front of Tom, and then I think Tom did, you know, backflips around the studio like one of those Woody Woodpecker cartoons. Um, but we we immediately bonded on what we want to do with it, how we want to tell this story, and uh, um, for the, this idea of bring it into you know the next evolution of you know TMNT and IDW. Awesome, yeah. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, you know what? Actually, for me, it was. I mentioned this before, it, it blew my mind for a, a number of reasons. One, it was just so prescient, the, the predictions that, uh, especially like Peter were making about technology and even like the political makeup of 2017, which was, was Kevin and Peter's future at that point. I guess all of our future at that point. Uh, it was pretty remarkable. I, I keep calling him Peter Nostradamus because a lot <laughs> of the stuff was just so bizarrely accurate. Um, but just the vibe itself that got me excited was, Kevin and I, I think, you know, we're great friends and we're like brothers from another mother, but I think creatively and just as fans, we like a lot of the same stuff. It just, it, we just have a lot of things in common. And there were like a th couple of things that just jumped out at me right away was kind of the, the obviously the, the Dark Knight Returns vibe of the, of the pitch, but also the Blade Runner vibe of it. And I'm huge Blade Runner fan, huge. And so there were just, there were just elements that I thought, man, these are all things we like, both of us, that we can bring together into this story. The catch being because 2017 was no longer the future, it was actually the past when we were reading it. Uh, and a lot of that stuff was ar already existing. I told Kevin, we're going to have to put on our thinking caps and, and become Peter ourselves, our own personal Peter Lairds, and make up some future tech because all this stuff exists already. So there was, you know, there was that challenge immediately that, that some of this stuff is outdated but not in a way that's bad it's outdated in a way that you guys nailed it and it already happened so maybe uh this was some you guys know, sent out vibes to the universe and then the universe responded and, and created these things including things like uh one of the things that really blew my mind was in the in the pitch and hopefully we'll, we'll print this someday in the trade there's a, a diagram of a of a flip phone a cell phone you know that didn't exist at that point and not I mean, exactly like what you would expect the Motorola's would have looked like when they first came out or whatever the, the company was. And, and so that for me was the opportunity not only to be part of something that Peter and Kevin created together, but maybe, you know, have a, a small part myself in, in adding to it, you know, uh, based on 2020 knowledge versus 1987 knowledge. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tom, you went into some really cool detail there with, you know, talking about Blade Runner and a, a futuristic sense, uh, sensibility in terms of the environs. I guess Kevin and Tom, could both of you guys kind of describe to me what that world looks like? Because obviously some, you know, a lot of people watching this right now have not read the book. I've had a sneak peek. I, I think, Tom, you're spot on. But yeah, if you could kind of describe a little bit more what that world looks like um, and, and how you got there. Well, you know, it was interesting that um, 
what I guess we were looking at is, is some of the issues that were sort of touched on again in 1987. You know, there was some global warming issues. There was some, you know, um, there was some pretty fantastical moments of, you know, Pete even um, elaborating on there was world peace at that time <laughs> and things that we all had, were hoping and, 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 and st are still hoping for. Um, but I feel like um, we, we wanted to focus the story on the heart and soul of the story, which is this, this long standing family aspect of it. So the characters you're really going to see besides all the main turtle characters um, um, that are included in this story, but the main character in, in the, um, in the story is the city of New York, which has changed. Uh, global warming has uh, raised sea level. So it's almost, it's a walled city. It's kind of been taken over by a, an exceptionally bad, bad guy, a bad person. Um, and uh, the story that evolves within the, that, that construct is sort of, we don't touch on world issues that much. We don't touch on what's going on everywhere else. It's just sort of, we want to sort of really nail it down to elements that you'd seen all the way back to Turtles issue one um, and, 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 you know, the IDW Turtle issue one, but that's, that's it too, that we didn't want to set it in any specific iteration of the turtles it does lean very heavily obviously towards the mirage version but we wanted it again like tom mentioned earlier this dark knight aspect where it's sort of within that structure but it's sort of a story within itself um and and keep it um it gave us a room to to, to maneuver the way we wanted to and tell a really you know um, heartfelt story i think you know what kevin we never talked about that but it's interesting too we talk about the technology a lot i never thought about it but it's true that the idea in 1987 that the city could be walled off and isolationless like that didn't because back in the 80s, back in the Cold War, we we're talking about worldwide issues, you know, nuclear war and stuff. Now, suddenly we are very isolationless. I can't even say that word, but, you know, nationalistic. These things have kind of come about in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And, and so it's interesting that a walled city like that makes sense in a way now that it might not have been. And, and so, um, but it, like Kevin says, it allows us to present the city itself as has often been done in New York City, but as, as a character, as a true character with, within the story. That's really interesting. I, I, I think, you know, we talked about the Dark Knight. They do a lot of that with Gotham City, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the exact kind of, it almost, it is a part of the story as a character, as, you're, as you two are saying. Uh, you know, that's, and that's kind of been a theme in some of, the turtle stories pass, but you know, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up was that generally speaking, a big theme in turtles has always been family. And has always been, there's four turtles, there's four of them. They have a father figure in, in Splinter, things like that. You have this story where there's only one turtle, obviously the last Ronin singular. Um, where, you know, where did that, like, can you talk about how this theme is, uh, comes in in relation to the new storyline, um, the theme of family and, and how you ended up with, you know, how you kind of ended up with this? Well, um, I guess I'll start in just that it was one of those, um, when you strip away all the layers, like you, you, you said, we, we said multiple times, is this family aspect of it. And you strip away everything back to the, the very first issue of the turtles. It was, the turtles in a sense were, were raised as part of a, a revenge plot, if you will. Um, Splinter raised them to, uh, um, uh, you know, take revenge on the on um, Oroku Saki. Um, and, and, and so we sort of wanted to go, well, um, there's so much stuff that's happened in, again, different turtle universes. We want to take it back to the most basic components again and say, this is what it was. And what if you stripped away everything else and then that's where you started where there's just one singular turtle um left alive to to it was decided to complete that that task um for the most part so that's really i guess the seed and i'm trying desperately not to give anything away <laughs> um too much away that's kind of the seed in the kernel of the the story is that you know it's it's a it's revenge it's redemption is you know it's important to um honor family and, and so this last remaining um turtle is has got the weight of the world on his shoulders the weight of his family on his shoulders and and, and needs to deal with it um, and, and then we get this you know this chance to uh kind of revisit a history that's never been presented before because this is its own story um i mean initially obviously this pointed back to the mirage stories when peter and, and kevin were creating this 
it is its own universe. Now, this is kind of you think about those uh, those those timelines. There's always infinite timelines, infinite possibilities. This is just another one of those those turtles timelines. However, that being said, thematically, it points very strongly back like to just the origin, the, the Mirage origins, and like Kevin said, the kind of the revenge as aspect that uh, Splinter establishes that that we've always kind of seen in all the iterations, including in the IDW ongoing, there was that aspect to it. Um, but what we've also, what we get a chance to do here is show how the last Ronin became the last Ronin. So I don't want fans thinking, oh, there's just going to be one turtle and I'm not going to get my favorite turtle in this. All, all turtles are represented in this story and we get to see how this particular turtle became the sole survivor and what happened to his brothers. And so you not only see the effect prior to him becoming the last Ronin, but how their their deaths have affected him af afterwards and how he carries both the, the, the family mission, but also uh, traditions, memories, both good and bad with him, within within himself. And I think it's, um, it's something that's pretty fascinating to me just because I think everybody loses people in life and you carry a piece of them with you sometimes good, sometimes bad. And in this case, we get to, to show uh, both aspects uh, with, with the last Roman. You know, I don't, I don't want either of you to give this away because it's such a, it's such a great part of the book. Um, but, you know, why, why have a kind of a secrecy around who, which of these turtles is the last Ronin? Like what, what kind of uh, inspired you to, to keep that kind of under wraps for, for at least the first issue before the first issue? Well, I guess it's, you know, for me, the idea at least kicked off was, um, um, you know, going against um, type, I guess, you know, I mean, some, you know, I, I feel like sometimes in, 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 in some TV shows or, or movies, a lot of times that they feel they have to set up, you know, the players, the characters, everything in the first episode, or you're never going to get people to stay, stay tuned. Um, I guess, um, for the most part. But I, I always liked the stories that um, had a natural evolution where you could leave those surprises. So you don't always see, you know, the ticking time bomb under the desk or see, you know, the, these kind of giveaways. So we wanted it to naturally evolve in, uh, in a way that um, made the story more exciting for us to tell, which which hopefully will, will come across the way we, we we're planning it. And that you'll see as each issue goes along, there's, there's things that... Um, you know, just, you know, by the end of issue one, you still have no idea where it's going in issue two or three or four. And that's just really the, the way we wanted it. So it's got to have that, 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 that stuff thing. So this was the, a great sort of important um, and fun for us um, to, to, as a dramatic element to, to wait for the big reveal. I, I think it's kind of representative. It's kind of a macrocosm or microcosm of, of the bigger picture. Us keeping the identity secret was really part of the evolution of this story, I think, because there was a point where we were, weren't even sure we were going to say who it was uh, and, and maybe kind of leave it ambiguous. And, and then ultimately we decided not to do that. That being said, I think it shows you how this story has developed for both Kevin and I, because we, we got the, the 1987 proposal, the outline that we started from, that was the foundation. But to this day, I mean, literally today, this, this story is weaving and bobbing and weaving for us, you know, and we're, 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 we're kind of bobbing and weaving with it because this, this story and these char this character is taking us where it, it needs to go, not where we thought it would go necessarily, but where it needs to go. And that's been, that's, it's pretty exciting. It keeps us on our toes for sure. Uh, and uh, I think even like when we were finishing issue one, we were even debating on, on uh, that issue, what we would, uh, reveal to the very i mean literally to the 11th hour we were like do we do this do we not how, how, how does this feel for you how does this feel for me and and that's been making it's making it exciting which means every page every panel is fresh for even us you know it's it's it's, it's literally being created as as we go and i think that's 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 very different than I, i'd say how we did the uh, the ongoing because we would work closely with bobby kern our editor obviously with Nickelodeon and Viacom and usually we have a pretty set outline when I sat down to script it, you know, something that we all agreed on. This one, we have an outline and we know what we want to do. We know beginning, middle and end, but everything else is kind of taking care of itself as we uh, progress. You know, uh, I, that kind of, I mean, that's, that's super interesting. 
uh, Tom, I, I think that's absolutely fascinating, especially with the story that's kind of story idea that's been around for so long. I guess, Kevin, I wanted to ask, you know, what made you, obviously this is a, it's a really exciting story. It's something that you can kind of describe in one sentence and anybody would be really just excited the prospect of reading it. But other than that, that is a great idea. Like what made you want to go back to this, you know, this idea that you've had for 30 years, basically, you know, what, what made you want to go back? And I guess Tom to, you know, what, what drew you to this story so strongly? Well, you know, what was interesting is um, around the time that the story's original creation in 1987, Peter and I were, were wrapping up um, issue 11 of Turtles, which if you include issue 11 plus the four one shots featuring each Turtles, um, that's the complete foundation of all things Mirage at that time and all things Turtles. And we weren't sure where we wanted to take the story in issue 12. I had lots of ideas and things. Um, and so one day we were sitting down and we just said, we looked 30 years down and we said, well, where would they be in 30 years? And, and we'll, so we'll see it over there and then let's figure out how to get there. And quite similarly um, with issue 100 looming um, when we, Tom and I really sunk our teeth into this one, it was the same thing that you could see issue 100. Um, we knew, you know, where the story was going, but it was, where's it going after that? And so that kind of clicked. And I said, that's just like, you know, this thing, you know, 34 years ago at that time that we, Peter and I are doing. So that was, that was the reason to, to dig it out and really take a hard look at it and say like, well, let's, it's, it's time to, you know, look at, you know, 30 years down the road or 20 years down the road. I don't think we even say exactly how, how far away it is for us, but that was what started making it, it, it exciting and, and really um, challenging to um, um, address the this, this story. And it's, and like, you know, Tom said too, it's been interesting that, and I always, you know, I'd said this to Tom many times through the process of getting to the five issue outline and getting through issue one. And now what we're doing in issue two is it's the closest I've come to working with somebody the way I, I worked originally with Peter Laird, which is, you know, writing back and forth. And then I'll, I'll do the layouts and things arrive out of the, the, the layouts that then we you know, almost, I don't say not Marvel style, but then Tom and I have to go back and readdress because bits of the story we go, oh, we did this, this, and this, but we forgot about that. So it's just this really great, you know, again, I don't want to repeat what Tom just said, but this is amazing evolution. We know where the last Ronin is going and where it's going in each issue, or at least the ending for sure. Um, and now it's sort of the path um, that we're being carried on to, to complete that is, 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 uh, incredibly exciting and, and maybe a little stressful, but it's <laughs> <laughs> the hype is what terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. Going back to your earlier question, Blake, why, why keep uh, the last Ronin secret? Cause that's some great hype, man. You get people on board. Wondering. <laughs> so it's like, you hope it pays off, but it, it will. And I, I think kind of answer your, your, your question from my end, we did, you know, the ongoing a hundred plus issues. I mean, a hundred, of monthly issues plus annuals and, and free comic book days and one shots. And, and it got to a point where at 100, the one thing I knew was I wasn't tired of turtles at all. That, and that shows you the power of, of the, the turtles. And there were more stories to tell, but I started to feel like, am I, am I selfish if I wanted to enter, you know, to inject myself post 100, you know, there does come a point where there, it's time for a fresh voice and a, and a fresh vision. And, you know, we started talking about that at the office, you know, there, there were decisions to be made after 100 and we all came to the, the conclusion that, you know what, it, it, it was time to kind of let it go in a new direction. And, and that was to bring in Sophie Campbell and let Sophie present her image, her vision for the turtles. And which was absolutely hundred percent the right move. She's doing a wonderful job. And it's, it's really, I think, refreshed the line in the way it needed to after 100. We, we told a story one to 100 that we were happy with, but I also knew I wasn't, done with the turtles I just wasn't sure what that meant you know would I would I you know guessed right in the on the ongoing where was this going to take me and when Kevin showed me the outline then I knew this this was not just the next evolutionary step I think for IDW turtles you know to be able to tell this other story that's you know a little darker a little more maybe uh, mature than the, the ongoing story not that that one isn't but this one certainly is a level up from that, but it was also, I thought the, the next evolutionary step for Kevin and I 
in this process. And it's proven that way. Not only, you know, as far as what the story is about and, and the, the themes of this story, but also like Kevin said, how we are creating the story. It's completely different than what we did for a hundred issues um, in the sense that, like I said, that was very organized. If you ever want to meet the most organized person, that's Bobby Kernow. And cause he's gotta be running the big turtle ship at, at IW. So we were always very organized. Everything, you know, was pretty much in front of us as we were, were driving forward like this and as this one is is day by day moment by moment but i think that's what not only this the story needs but i think it's what kevin and i needed it was time for us to kind of have a, a, a refreshing approach to how we were creating turtles for idw um and and i think the irony of that is i didn't want to be selfish i didn't want to be selfish with the main line i didn't want to stay on it there's there comes a time when you need to step away and let somebody else talk but I'm starting to feel selfish again with this. <laughs> so, and, and, I, and I think Kevin is too, because we thought we'll tell this story, this last Ronin story, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get this out to the world and this will be the Dark Knight Returns. But I think probably what Frank Miller was feeling and is feeling with that universe, you start to realize, I think I have more stories to tell in this world, given the chance. So we've already, you know, kind of been throwing ideas for sequels and prequels at each other and and it's hard not to um obviously we have to finish this one first and hopefully people will like it but it 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 for me and i, and I think kevin you'll agree it feels right just the same way the ongoing felt right for so long it just feels like like it, it's kismet and, and serendipity or whatever you want to call it it's all coming together in a way that just so natural and so easy and equally terrifying just like the main line was for nine years that I'm, I'm really excited about seeing where this goes not just for for the story itself but for us as creators well, that makes sense both of you touched on this aspect of of the storytelling because obviously we're going back we're talking about 1987 some you know so many decades ago at this point the the there's such a generational aspect of turtles fandom which is very ingrained in this series, right? This is a 30 year old outline. You're talking about kind of turtles growing up and, and telling a different type of story for, you know, for maybe a little bit more mature or whatever you want to, however you want to call it, Tom. Um, but from that regard, like, I, I just want to know, you know, I've heard, I've heard you, um, both of you on the record as saying this is like a love letter to past team and team iterations, you know, how, I guess, looking at that and knowing that, how do you look and how do you allow, I guess, different generations of fans guide your storytelling and guide this story in particular? Well, it's, it's a, that's a really good question because it really, um, you know, it's almost like, um, I don't want to say you, you, you can't do that or you shouldn't, you shouldn't try to, I mean, uh, um, pay attention to that. But you, you, well, let me start by saying, you know, when, when Peter and I started, you know, issue one, we never thought it'd be an issue two. And so when we did issue two, um, it was just, you know, we moved away from sort of the, the, the heavily influential parody sort of aspect of it and did a story within itself. And then it kept going from there. But we never we never thought about doing anything in um, those early issues um, because, hey, let's do this because we think fans will like it. We, we were sort of very selfish and very cocky in the sense that we have a chance to tell s stories with the characters that we created exactly how we wanted. We were writing them for ourselves, and if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, it didn't. Um, and we were, you know, um, overwhelmingly blessed times of a, a million, billion, trillion. Um, and I feel like, you know, when um, I first met Tom and, and Bobby and the team at IDW and Tom rolled out what he wanted to do as a, as a core foundation to build the IDW turtle universe from, um, there was some really exciting elements that he created. And, and it was exciting to me because it was exciting to him. He was sort of like, he was a fan of the many, many different iterations of the turtles, but he, had his own die ideas and structures and how he was going to sort of pick from turtle universes and pull them into this foundation, which we could tell stories. And I think even then it was sort of, Hey, if we can get a year or, you know, if, if we can get a, a year of storytelling out of this and, and 12 issues, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the audience came and the ideas clicked and it worked and it hit that audience level. And so, 
you know, I think as we sort of move past the first year into, um, you know, what was going to be a, um, hopefully a long running series, it was like almost cocky to say, wonder what's, you know, this is where we could be at issue 50. And that was the, ele- the most important element was always story first when each of those issues um, evolved and, and it did, you know, this organic growth, it was, it was story first. And so, um, you know, bringing that straight up to, you know, what we're doing with the last Ronin, it's, it's very similar. It was not like um, um, most of the discussions that Tom and I are having, and we'll probably have later today and well, every day for the next year um, as we get through this series is um, what we're telling on this story is it's, it's gotta be story first and it's gotta work for me and it's gotta work for Tom first. And that's, that's the, that's the main concern. If we've done our job, because um, we're probably just as big a geeks in the room as anybody else is, is going to read it. And it is intended for an older audience. Um, um, but um, I think that um, if we stick to our guns and, and tell the kind of story that we really like, then, then I think it's going to work the way it should. Um, yeah. And, and I kind of like, it's funny, I've always, since we started, since I personally started working on Turtles, you know, way back when, for me, everything's kind of a love letter to the first Turtles comic regardless. You know, and, and, and I've been lucky to work in some video games that include the Turtles and, and things like that. But even even working on the video game scripts and stuff, it was always, to me, it's always a love letter back to that first issue, which is, is like the most amazing pop culture lightning in a bottle that you can imagine. I mean, the very fact that all these years later, we're still talking about it and it still feels fresh and it's still like exciting and people are still anticipating you know, the, the stuff that's coming down the line shows you how important TMNT is just to the, the world in general, you know? So it's a, it's a, it feels like a huge responsibility. Um, it certainly feels like I'm, I'm blessed. I, I, I count my blessings every day. I know how lucky I am to be able to do this and, you know, combine those two things. It's important then that what you present is, is respectful to what came before, but the stuff that came before is so good. I would be a, a fool if I didn't steal from it, you know, and kind of <laughs> incorporate it in, into what I did. So I, I try to do that for, for the nine years on the ongoing. And even now we're, we're kind of doing it with Ronan a little bit, but it's also like Kevin, and I mentioned earlier, this is also a love letter to things outside of turtles that, that we cherish dark Knight returns. I, I probably have read that a, a million times and I'll read it a million more times. I, I love both Blade Runner movies, you know, and, and so there's aspects of that, but there's, there's other, other aspects in this from other stories, movies, you know, that, that we're, we're finding a way to incorporate into this particular Turtles universe that we're building. And so I think it's, it's just one of those things like Kevin's saying is we're having fun with this. And if we're not having fun, then we know it's, it must not be working. So we'll change it. If there's, you know, anything that we do on a page and we're like, this isn't, this isn't clicking for us, then we need to change it because if it doesn't click for us, then it's not going to click for for the readers for the fans and and that's important for us because at the end of the day like kevin said we're fans too you know it, it to me the creative process has always been weird i never I will, i'll never ever never believe it's me i always believe that creatively things flow through me sometimes and they, i don't know where they're coming from and who's sending them to me but they flow through me and i want to make sure that that I, I'm, I'm the proper conduit, you know, and then when it, when it's finally out there, it, it's something that if I wasn't the one that was flowing through and I was just a person picking it up, it'd be something that I'd want to pick up and read. I don't want just to, to throw things on paper and say, here you go, you know, and, and here's, here's a stamp. It's TMNT. You should like it. it. It's, it's more than that. It's always been more than that for me. And, and, and that's why, and I know it is for Kevin too, because it would be easy Honestly, Kevin, you could rest on your laurels at this point, really, and you and he never does. I mean, we're when we're like talking about something, a small part of a panel in the artwork that's in the corner that only we may notice, then you know it's still important. You know, that does does this little thing need to be changed? Because it's if it's important to us, then we know there's readers out there. It's important to them too, and so I think I think it's like I said, it's it's a love letter. But it's also just a continuation of this, this, I don't know, miracle of pop culture that just continues to give, you know, and, and for right now, at this point in time, I'm, I'm happy and, and excited and, and grateful to be part of it. Perfectly said. 
Um, before we wrap up here, is there any kind of last things that you either of you wanted to say to fans out there that may be about to read the first book, may have just read the first book, just any last things you want to say to, to all the people watching out there? Um, you know, you know, it's, 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 it would sort of be summing up and repeating a, a bunch of what we, we just said, especially in the, in the last question in the idea that, um, you know, um, the, I, the, the story we're writing is a writing it for ourselves, but, but we're, we're, you know, being the big fans that we are, we, we feel like, um, um, you know, we just want it to be great and we want it to be great for ourselves. And, and if we hit that bar and we set that bar pretty high, we hope that the fans will, will see it. And it'll mean the same to them that, um, you know, we, we, we couldn't have done a hundred issues without their support. I would not be doing turtles, um, you know, for 36 years now without their support and still having the time of my life. So, so um, you know, it is sort of, um, if it is a love letter to, you know, all things turtles, especially Peter Laird, um, it's also a love letter to the fans uh, that this is something that, you know, we're, we're writing to our ourselves, which, you know, we're all of you and you are all of us. And so, um, you know, hang tight. I think you're going to dig it. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, there's actually one more thing that I, I think is really exciting for this on this one for me is, is I think there's uh, some talent on the art side, that yeah. will really get a chance to uh, get some notoriety after this. Uh, obviously, there's scores of brothers who are drawing over Kevin's layouts. But um, as long as I was writing Turtles, the main line, I was also editing Ghostbusters for IDW. And we had one colorist on Ghostbusters all that time, uh, Luis Antonio Delgado. And I'm really excited for Luis, great guy, who uh, is getting a chance to really, uh, I think, show his talent off to a larger audience than, than he's had at this point and, and deservedly so. It's, it's very exciting. Um, so I think the combination of Kevin on the layouts, the Scores of Brothers drawing over those and, and Louise coloring them is, is, is a, it's a sight to behold. And, and I think people are, and then obviously we've got uh, kind of our, our, our guy that's gonna surprise people as well with what he's doing in the project, Ben Bishop. So it's, um, it's definitely a team effort and, and I, it's a team I'm excited to be a part of. Um, and I'm hoping, uh, like Kevin said, part of that team also is the fans and we're, we, we, we've got plenty of room for fans. Come on board. And, uh, let us know what you think. I love it. It's awesome. Um, so just finishing up here, uh, issue number one of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the last Ronin limited series will be available print and digitally wherever comics are sold. Uh, uh, TMNT fans, if you want it physically, obviously comicshoplocator.com to find a store near you um, to pick up this amazing issue. So I want to give a thanks to Kevin and Tom. Thank you both for joining us today, taking the time. I know you're super busy, but this is this is so awesome to get to hear from you and, and get to hear some amazing insight for this book that, you know, I've just read. It's a perk of the job. I just read it. It's awesome. So, um, so anyway, thank you both. And uh, yeah, couldn't be more excited.